The Hope Diamond, the most famous diamond in the world, is housed in Washington, D.C.'s Smithsonian Institution. For centuries, its radiance has hypnotized kings and commoners alike. But some believe that the gem's alluring sparkle is in fact a deadly siren song. Stories of grave misfortune emerge from its mysterious past. They say the Hope Diamond carries a curse so powerful that it can topple governments, so evil that it can kill. What forces really lie in the depths of this magnificent blue gem? Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. On this program, The Hope Diamond, a jewel said to be worth around $200 million that is rumored to hold a deadly spell over those who have owned it through the years. First, a popular 19th century American actress who believed the Hope Diamond ruined her life. Then, the story of the flamboyant Washington socialite, Evelyn Walsh McLean, who scoffed at the curse even though her life was filled with one misfortune after another. Are there reasonable explanations for the curse of the Hope Diamond? Or will its haunting legacy remain unexplained. Mystery and infamy have followed one of the most beautiful diamonds into the modern world. Since its discovery, the Hope Diamond has been shrouded in myth, a myth that has made it virtually impossible to view the brilliant blue treasure as a simple stone. The story of how the diamond got its name is filled with tragic characters, born to enormous wealth, and fated, it seems, for disaster. Henry Philip Hope was a descendant of a noted London family, the creators of the powerful and wealthy banking firm, Hope and Company. Henry lived off his large inheritance and concentrated on his primary interests, collecting paintings and precious stones. In 1830, Hope paid 18,000 pounds, or $90,000, for a special diamond described as magnificent and rare, a deep sapphire blue. Rumor had it the gem was cursed. Bad things are supposed to happen to whoever owned the diamond. Some people would take it so far as to anyone who's touched the diamond, anybody who gets close to the diamond. You know, everybody has a different idea. Hope may not have feared this legendary curse, but he was certainly aware of it. He traced the origin of his purchase back to the mid-1600s. In doing so, he uncovered an unsettling tale, the story of an opportunist in the Golconda region of India, the leading provider of the world's diamonds. The earliest writings about the Hope uh, came from the French traveler and gem merchant Tavernier, who brought back the, a large blue ruff from his travels to India. Tavernier is said to have stolen the jewel from the eye or forehead of a Hindu statue in the early part of the 17th century. Supposedly, the theft so angered the gods that they cursed all future owners of the beguiling gem. The stone, however, brought Tavernier some well-documented good fortune. In 1668, he was summoned to Versailles by Louis XIV. The king bought almost 1,200 of his jewels, including a dazzling blue diamond. The gigantic rough gem of over 112 carats was cut, set, and incorporated into a ceremonial necklace called the Order of the Golden Fleece. The king's great-great-great-grandson, Louis XVI, inherited both the throne and perhaps the curse of the magnificent royal pendant. Which was only worn by the king and not by the queen, 
which means that Marie Antoinette did not at least incur the wrath of the diamond directly. Those who believe in the deadly curse insist that Marie Antoinette must have worn the diamond. For when the French Revolution overwhelmed the aristocracy, she suffered the same fate as her husband, the guillotine. The new republic seized the jewels of the French crown, including the blue diamond. But in a daring theft, they were stolen from the highly guarded treasury. Some of the crown jewels were recovered, but the French blue had vanished. The jewel spent the next few decades in the shadows. It was rumored to have surfaced in England, then returned to France. Eventually, the diamond found a home. There is little doubt among experts that the Hope family's gem was recut from the stolen French blue. The diamond passed down through three generations of the Hope family without incident, until it ended up in the hands of Lord Francis Hope, a frivolous young man in line to become the Duke of Newcastle. Lord Francis Hope's wealth fueled his vices, primarily gambling and excessive spending. In the early 1890s, while visiting New York, he met an even greater temptation an actress named May Yoy. Lord Hope first saw her during her triumphant run as the title character in the musical Little Christopher Columbus. At the time, May reigned as the undisputed queen of musical theater in New York and London. Poised and radiant under the lights, she would tease her adoring audience by wearing one knicker provocatively above the knee. Lord Francis Hope was bewitched. She was popular and he adored her and supposedly gave her a necklace of pear-shaped pearls. Although the purchase of the pearls left the star-struck Hope bankrupt, May wasn't worried. She was well aware that Lord Hope's family possessed a legendary treasure, a sparkling jewel with a tainted past. May married Lord Hope on November 27, 1894. Soon after the nuptials, however, May learned her husband's family had placed the Hope Diamond in a trust that Lord Hope could not dissolve. The trust was a safeguard against his persistent attempts to sell it for needed cash. He was going to the, the courts requesting permission to, to sell the Hope Diamond. And he tried this several times. His family challenged it several times. By most accounts, May wore the diamond on only two occasions, right after their wedding and again two years later. Placing the Hope Diamond around her neck even once was enough. She soon found herself in the stranglehold of the supposed curse. May's relationship with Lord Hope quickly fell apart. Hope continued to gamble, fell deeper into debt, and became increasingly inattentive to his famous wife. They hadn't been married so terribly long before she became interested in the son of the mayor of New York and left Hope. May and her new lover, Putnam Bradley Strong, lived off her substantial savings. But this new affair, like her last, did not turn out well for the actress. Strong convinced May to sell her own expensive gems to supplement their income. Then he stole the rest and abandoned her. May returned to the stage in 1912, heartbroken and penniless. She reprised her role in Little Christopher Columbus, but could not recapture her former glory. The musical opened to poor reviews. Sadly, Lord Hope was her last adoring fan. Lord Francis Hope fell in love with her and stayed in love with her even after they were divorced because he is supposed to have been sitting in the audience listening to her sing and crying. Although Lord Francis Hope had finally been allowed to sell his diamond, its fabled curse seemed to linger. He struggled with gambling debts, lost his leg in a hunting accident, and his second wife died tragically young. By this time, May was publicly blaming her own misfortune on the curse 
of the Hope family's precious jewel. She had once played the coquettish maid on stage before the crowned heads of Europe. Now she found herself living the role of a scrubwoman on the filthy docks of Seattle, Washington. May finally seized upon a bold and resourceful solution. She decided that if the Hope Diamond still controlled her fate, she might as well retain the prestige of having been its mistress. Then she discovered another way to profit from her association with it. She sold her story to Hollywood. The result, the 1921 movie serials, The Hope Diamond Mystery, a series based loosely on May's experiences. Although too old to portray herself in the series, May wrote and directed the overwrought dramas. The films revolved around the evil emanating from this accursed beauty. There was murder and mayhem, thievery, and an all-star cast of suspicious-looking operators. Once the Hope Diamond found its next victim, calamity was only a breath away. The Hope Diamond mysteries were well received. After the series had run its course, May and her third husband looked for other ways to capitalize on the mysterious gem. She has started this Blue Diamond Inn where they hoped would be a fortunate place for them, but it burned down after a very short time. And so that, in keeping with the, the diamond's uh, reputation, didn't help then either. The diamond's curse had supposedly struck its most vocal believer for the final time. At age 69, May was still struggling to make ends meet. In 1938, she suffered a heart attack at her job in a federal work program and died soon afterwards. Lord Hope came to a very different end. He succeeded to the dukedom of Newcastle in 1928. He died quietly at the age of 75, but the curse may not have been finished with the Hopes. The family line would be extinguished within a few decades. In World War II, the Hope Archives burned to the ground during the London Blitz, reducing their legacy to rubble. All that remained to carry on the Hope name was this resilient gem, soon to haunt another family of extreme wealth and grave misfortune. The Hope Diamond, a rare blue gem unearthed in the mines of India was once carefully guarded in the treasure houses of European nobility. Centuries later, it became a plaything around the neck of a Washington socialite named Evelyn Walsh McLean. Her eccentric behavior and troubled life reinforced the renowned curse of the Hope Diamond in the public imagination. This decadent and disturbing chapter in the Hope Diamond's history began in 1886 in the mountains of Denver, Colorado. Evelyn was born to a modest, hardworking family. She would have been destined for a humble way of life if not for an incredible stroke of providence. When she was only 10, her father, a part-time prospector, discovered gold nine miles from their home. The Walshers became instant millionaires. The family left Colorado and moved to Washington, D.C., where they reinvented themselves as urban socialites and adopted a lavish lifestyle. So she was suddenly the daughter of a very wealthy man. They, they moved here to Washington, D.C. She seemed to enjoy the, the lifestyle of the rich and the famous. She had a, a passion for jewelry. You know, she loved to spend her father's money. In 1908, at the age of 22, Evelyn Walsh married Ned McLean, the wealthy son of newspaper baron John R. McLean, who owned the Washington Post and the Cincinnati Inquirer. Their honeymoon was the height of excessive indulgence, a harbinger of troubled times to come. The couple roamed across Europe and the Middle East for months. Each father contributed $100,000 for the trip. Even this proved to be inadequate. When Evelyn's father wired additional funds, he told her, 
Be sure to buy yourself a wedding present from me. A trip to Paris in search of expensive jewels led her to the shop of Pierre Cartier, where she spent every last dollar of the money. Little did she know she would soon return to the same store in search of a far greater treasure, one that perhaps would exact a higher price than she could ever have imagined. The gem that carried a deadly curse was about to enter the life of Evelyn Walsh McLean. Two years after the honeymoon, on another trip to Paris, Evelyn first laid eyes on the Hope Diamond. By now, her life had changed. Her overly indulgent father had died months before, and she was the mother of an infant son. There was one thing, however, that remained from her gloriously rich honeymoon, an overwhelming passion for expensive jewels. She returned to Paris in 1910 with her husband and visited again with Pierre Cartier, who said to her, I have something to show you. And then on a fateful day, Pierre Cartier went to their suite at the Bristol Hotel. Cartier brought with him a small, mysterious package that was tightly wrapped with wax seals. And he carefully, and she described it as theatrically, unwrapped this parcel millimeter by millimeter. And then he said to her, here it is, it's the Hope Diamond. Cartier told the enthralled Evelyn the legend of the diamond. It was rumored to be cursed and would bring bad luck to anyone who wore or even touched it. Bad luck objects, said Evelyn Walsh McLean, for me are lucky. She described the sensation of touching the stone for the first time, and she said her fingers were tingling as she held this stone. At first, Evelyn resisted the singular charms of the Hope Diamond. She told Cartier she didn't like the setting and returned to the States without the gem. This did not deter Pierre Cartier. He knew that despite her protestations, she was entranced by the jewel. He had found a buyer. She was his first call and his only call in presenting this stone. When she saw it for the first time, he knew that she wanted this stone, and it then became a matter of time only before she would acquire it. A month later in November 1910, Ned McLean received a letter informing him that Mr. Pierre Cartier had arrived from Europe that morning. It stated, he has brought with him the documents concerning the Hope Diamond. Evelyn's husband agreed to a meeting. But rather than discuss any business, Cartier urged the McLeans to keep the jewel for the weekend. It was in a new setting, and he suggested that they take it home as a sort of trial visit. The English poet laureate Samuel Daniel once wrote that diamonds were the orators of love, and there was no more persuasive companion than the Hope Diamond that evening. Evelyn sat gazing at the jewel deep into the night, mesmerized by its sublime brilliance. She made the fateful decision that she had to own it. It took months for the McLeans and Cartier to agree on the elaborate terms. They eventually settled on a price of $180,000, which included the trade-in of some of Evelyn's other jewelry. Evelyn and her husband signed the note, and she fastened the chain around her neck. She was now inextricably linked to the Hope Diamond and its mythic curse. When she bought the stone, she had specifically written into the bill of sale two very interesting and very unique clauses, two clauses that we've never again seen either before that or since then. Clause number one said that if there were any deaths in her immediate family in the first 18 months of her ownership, that Cartier would take the stone back for full credit. Secondly, if there were any deaths in her immediate family, Cartier would pay an indemnity unspecified. Evelyn's mother-in-law, Emily Beale McLean, and a family friend were strongly opposed to the purchase. They feared the diamond's curse, 
and persuaded Evelyn to return the stone. Cartier, however, would not hear of it. He immediately sent it back. Evelyn relented easily. She decided to keep the gem. Within a year, the two women who had warned her of its evil were dead. Both died of natural causes. However, in Evelyn's mind, the legendary curse cast a long shadow of doubt over their deaths. While she knew that they could simply be a matter of coincidence, the superstition surrounding the jewel made a rational explanation difficult to accept. The death of her mother-in-law allowed Evelyn to invoke the escape clause written into her contract with Cartier. She was unwilling to let it go so easily. She decided to combat the supposed curse with a blessing. A Catholic priest performed the ceremony. Legend has it that even though it was a bright sunny day, a bolt of lightning erupted from the sky, destroying a tree outside the church. In her diary, Evelyn wrote that she ignored this strange portent. She said she found comfort in the blessing. The Hope Diamond became Evelyn's constant companion. She would walk about with the priceless gem around her neck, in her hair, or stuffed away in a sofa for safekeeping. My mother used to tell me that she remembered that her grandmother, Evelyn McLean, would actually wear the Hope Diamond on the streets of Moscow. And she would also wear the diamond to distribute sandwiches to World War I veterans. And she'd also allow her great Dane, Mike, wear it around the house. Evelyn was cavalier about the diamond's security and every evening placed it in this simple crystal case. Owning it, however, dramatically compromised her family's safety. Kidnapping threats on the couple's three sons were so numerous that special guard houses were set up around the family home in Georgetown and 24-hour detectives were hired as security guards. But even these measures could not protect her family. While playing in the yard one Sunday morning, Evelyn's firstborn son, Vincent, darted out across the street and was hit by a slow-moving car. At first, he did not appear badly hurt. It seemed tragedy had been narrowly avoided. But within hours, the nine-year-old boy became paralyzed, lost consciousness, and died. Evelyn Walsh McLean never specifically blamed the diamond for her son's tragic death, yet she changed her mind frequently about its powers. Sometimes she denounced it as an evil amulet, while at other times she extolled its virtue. Washington socialite Evelyn Walsh McLean bought the Hope Diamond in 1911, insisting that its reputed curse would bring her nothing but good luck. However, the first eight years of her ownership of the Hope Diamond were haunted by grief. She suffered the deaths of her mother-in-law and one close family friend, then the loss of a son in a freak automobile accident. Despite these horrible blows, she would spend years claiming to have no fear of the diamond's fabled power. She enjoyed the notoriety the Blue Gem brought her far too much to consider avoiding the supposed hex by giving it up. From President Warren G. Harding to J. Edgar Hoover and filmmaker D.W. Griffith, guests at the McLean's homes were some of the most notable celebrities of the 1920s. But behind the facade of beautiful jewels and lavish entertaining, Evelyn Walsh McLean's marriage was deteriorating. After years of suffering through her husband's much publicized affairs, she divorced him in 1932. A year later, Ned was committed to a sanitarium for severe alcoholism. Their life of excess and indulgence was recorded in Evelyn's home movies. Evelyn, now in charge of the family money, remained careless about her finances. Despite the Great Depression, she spent as recklessly as she had in her youth. 
she quickly found herself entangled in financial difficulties too great to bear. The Washington Post, which had been losing money for years, was one victim of her fiscal irresponsibility. She was forced to sell the paper at a bankruptcy auction in 1933. In those lean years, the Hope Diamond served as Evelyn's insurance against financial ruin. She often took it to New York City and pawned it when she needed quick cash, but would redeem it as soon as possible. Beatrice Burley Meyerson, whose parents were friends of the McLeans, recalls that not even World War II stopped Evelyn from wearing the dazzling jewel. My mother said she used to take it on airway duty with her and sort of pass it around for something to do while they were looking at the sky. Beatrice fondly remembers attending a party at Evelyn Walsh McLean's house in 1946 when she was 14 years old. This is McLean who said, uh, oh, it was lovely to see you and so on, but what should we do with Beatrice? And then she said, well, maybe she'd like to wear the Hope Diamond. And so she took off the Hope Diamond and put it around my neck. I think I sort of stood around looking at the Hope Diamond. I just do remember that I thought the stone was really neat. Perhaps Evelyn would not have regarded the gem as a child's plaything if she had foreseen the future of her only daughter. Emily, who later changed her name to Evelyn, was a lonely child with no friends her own age. All of her time was spent at parties where the Hope Diamond would, as usual, be displayed with pride. The younger Evelyn was forced by the family's prominence to live in a completely adult world. So it was hardly surprising when in 1941, at the age of 19, she married a man almost 40 years her senior, Senator Robert Reynolds of North Carolina. The two quickly became a news item. Reynolds had been dating the elder Mrs. McLean before deciding to marry her daughter. Bride and groom, Senator and Mrs. Robert R. Reynolds. The bride is the daughter of Mrs. Evelyn Walsh McLean, owner of the Hope Diamond. The notoriety of being born a McLean was, in the end, too much for young Evelyn. Only five years after her marriage, at the age of 24, Evelyn McLean Reynolds committed suicide with an overdose of sleeping pills. She left behind a four-year-old daughter, Mimi. Evelyn Walsh McLean was grief-stricken and never recovered from the loss. She succumbed to pneumonia one year later on April 26, 1947, at the age of 60. She died holding her cherished Hope Diamond close to her chest. Today, the Hope Diamond and its strange role in the life of Evelyn Walsh McLean remain in the minds of future generations. Joseph Gregory is the son of Mamie Spears Reynolds, who some say lost her mother to the curse of the Hope Diamond. He knows the lore of the jewel all too well. I have a lot of respect for the Hope Diamond. It has influenced not just my life, but my mother's life. Um, it influenced how she talks about it and her memories. Other family members refuse to believe that Evelyn's death released the McLeans from the lethal curse. Brownie McLean, the wife of Evelyn's son, Jock, claims she had an inexplicable experience when the diamond was offered to her. When we were married and the Hope Diamond was given to me if I wanted it, and I was so excited about it that I did want it desperately because I didn't know about the bad luck of the Hope Diamond. I was so excited, but the minute that I saw it, it it changed color in my eye. And um, I looked at it and I, I was about to touch it and it occurred to me that it was shooting off red sparks at me, don't touch me, like a flame. And I backed out of the room as quickly as I could. I'm happy that I didn't touch the stone because it seems to really bring bad luck to people. Evelyn's heirs may have been reluctant to acquire the ominous jewel, but a seductive treasure like the Hope Diamond never goes unclaimed for long. The modern-day legacy of the Hope Diamond's curse is largely due to the troubled story of its most famous owner, Evelyn Walsh McLean. The legend, however, did not die with Mrs. McLean. 
Shortly after her death, the diamond was acquired by the mysterious jewel merchant, Harry Winston. Winston generally refused to be photographed. He allowed no pictures of himself to be shown until after his death in 1978. His son, Ronald, who inherited the family business, upholds his father's tradition and will not show his face to the camera. He was very shy, and I think he was also worried about, um, you know, the big bad world. He had a policy with Lloyds of London, and they didn't want him photographed. And, and frankly, he was probably more mysterious not being photographed. I think in addition to security reasons, there is a whole uh, desire for, for Harry, and I'm sure for Ronald, to maintain a sort of anonymity today. Winston's fame was assured in 1949 when he purchased a 74-piece jewelry collection from the estate of deceased Washington socialite, Evelyn Walsh McLean. In the collection was the most notorious gem in the world, the Hope Diamond. Winston's son Ronald remembers his father's reaction to his greatest acquisition. He was very excited. And I asked him to describe it to me, and he called it Midnight Blue. He said it's Midnight Blue, and it's very mysterious. In Winston's hands, the cursed gem temporarily enjoyed a benevolent reputation. Winston immediately began displaying the diamond as the star attraction in his court of jewels. A traveling exhibition that raised money for charities, including the March of Dimes and polio research. When the Hope wasn't touring the country, it could often be found in its more customary role, adorning the neck of a pampered society matron. At times, it sat proudly on display in the window at Harry Winston's jewelry store. For Winston was utterly captivated by his most prized possession, and his strange relationship with the diamond only added to the mystery of its legendary curse. Harry would often put a diamond in his pocket as he went through the day and have his hand in his pocket and actually keep his hand on the diamond, probably as uh, to keep touch with something that he felt was very special and perhaps had some kind of powers, and I use that word loosely, uh, beyond anything normal might have, something to, uh, to keep him fascinated. Harry Winston may have felt that he garnered strength from the diamond, but it is unclear if he had any concerns about the so-called curse. Never really discussed it with me, but I do know that my mother never wore it, to the best of my knowledge. Winston, who had traveled extensively with his lovely wife, was passionate about the incredible crown jewel collections he had seen in many European countries. It was his dream to create an American version. In 1958, he donated the Hope Diamond to the Smithsonian believing it would make the National Gem Collection the envy of the world. He took this diamond and said, I'm going to give this diamond to the American people because I sense that there is something bigger to this diamond than just a diamond. Harry Winston wanted the delivery of the hope to be as dramatic as its long and mysterious history. My father, Harry, had a great sense of uh, showmanship and press. And he said, what better way to get it to the Smithsonian than to present it through the post? And he mailed it. The plain brown package that the Hope arrived in belied its worth. It was insured for a million dollars. The gem received a regal escort. Armed guards, policemen, and postal inspectors helped guide the package to its final destination. True to form, Winston avoided the media frenzy and sent his wife to make the presentation on his behalf. Now that the gem was in the possession of the United States government, many feared the famous curse would plague the entire nation. Despite the prophecies of doom, the Smithsonian has managed to keep the diamond safe. As the premier stone in the National Gem Collection, it is the most visited object in the entire museum. So I think people are curious to see what a blue diamond looks like. And I think the curse is part of it. 
Along with the legacy of the diamond, the museum has the daunting responsibility of protecting a 45 and a half carat stone, now valued at over $200 million. The initial display was a safe behind a wall with a double layer of riot glass. A new vault was designed in 1997. If someone tries to steal it, the diamond instantly drops through the floor into the vault below. The security is so elaborate, it covers not only visitors to the Smithsonian, but also the people responsible for the diamond's safety. We keep the design documents in our vaults. We've separated the aspects of the design among various groups of engineers so no one individual can, in fact, understand how the whole thing is put together. While the museum states there have been no attempts made to steal the Hope Diamond, these safeguards certainly add to the diamond's mystique. They must also tempt the egos of professional thieves. To steal it would be a challenge, and our reputation is on the line. But uh, I'm very well satisfied that precautions that we took and the precautions that the Smithsonian has instituted in their practices and procedures make, uh, make for a very secure environment. Some would say these measures safeguard more than a museum's priceless exhibit. They also protect those who might fall under the spell of the Hope Diamond's unsettling allure. The Hope Diamond has captured the world's attention as the gem with the deadly curse, capable of destroying the lives of European royalty and American socialites. It is now, however, the proud possession of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. While the museum staff dismisses these extraordinary claims, they readily admit that the diamond does have mysterious properties which they cannot explain. During a routine study of the museum's jewels by the Gemological Institute of America, a standard test revealed a surprising quality of the Hope Diamond. Diamonds have two properties under ultraviolet light. One is fluorescence, the other is phosphorescence. Fluorescence is when you shine ultraviolet light and they glow. Phosphorus is when you turn it off and it's still excited and it continues to glow. The Hope Diamond does not respond to ultraviolet light as normal diamonds do. Scientists note that when the light is turned off, the Hope glows longer than any diamond they have ever tested. The duration on the Hope when we examined it in 1996 was 30 to 40 seconds, which is probably the longest I've seen. So it was a very amazing feature when you see that happen, when the light source is turned off and the stone continues to glow this red color. An orange red may be symbolic of the turbulent history that it's gone through, and it does it for quite a long period of time. Any attribute that is so rare, I think, takes on a very mysterious quality. This pulsing red glow is as unsettling as it is inexplicable. The curious light of the Hope Diamond only enhances its legend, even within purely scientific circles. Why do people bestow the Hope Diamond with such magical powers, maintaining it toppled the French crown and destroyed the legacy of the powerful Hope family? Experts say the reason has more to do with who owns these famous gems than the stone's inherent power. If you just look at the careers of monarchs, which are obviously indissolubly coupled with those of famous stones, monarchs lived in turbulent times. There were plots and assassination attempts and so on. So the gems went along with that. Certainly, Evelyn Walsh McLean blamed the diamond for her troubles. This is not, however, a view shared by all McLean descendants. I think just because my family owned it and we had a lot of tragedies doesn't mean that the, the diamond is um, responsible for it. It happens in a lot of people's lives. I think we're just trying to find an excuse. 
Evelyn faced tragedy even before she owned the Hope Diamond. Her brother had died in an automobile accident. At that time, she also began a lifelong battle with an addiction to morphine. She had already been abusing alcohol since the age of 12. Evelyn may have found comfort in blaming the diamond for her misfortunes, and she certainly reveled in the attention the notorious curse brought her. Wouldn't you think that someone who wants to acquire the Hope Diamond would need to be a bit flamboyant? And isn't it kind of not surprising that the woman who did acquire it among the course of the owners of the diamond was somebody out outrageous and flamboyant? And, but that's her personality. The fascination with curses may also arise out of the universal human need to explain away tragedies both great and small a way of making bad luck or failure more acceptable. It is harmless for people to believe that there is luck as long as they don't take, as long as they don't use it to not take responsibility for their life. Experts remind us that superstitions have their roots in very real events. When the king and queen who owned the diamond were beheaded, the superstition surrounding the bad luck of what would become known as the Hope Diamond was given credence. The tragedies that befell subsequent owners only gave more power to the myth. As we look at the superstitions and, and the curses around the Hope Diamond and other things that are so, so grand, we have to look at what happened in those situations, what occurred to those families, and then how did a myth result around that? Because those are the myths that lead to the superstitions and those are not curses. Historians insist that much of the early history of the diamond is actually fiction, embellished in order to make the stone even more enticing. It's cursed by a lot of stories that it's cursed. I think that it's overdone. I think the recent healy-feely sort of situation is, uh, if you go with that, fine. You can believe in hobgoblins too. The most obvious explanation for the curse of the Hope Diamond may have to do with the captivating power of these beautiful stones. All precious stones have varying degrees of beauty, but the great stones have vast amounts of beauty, color deep within the stone, light reflecting magically in one's eyes. This is an alluring, almost magnetic attraction that people have for these stones. I like to think of uh, diamonds as tangible stars since mankind began to be human, has always admired the stars, write myths and songs and stories about the constellations and of course the stars are unattainable, but we can touch diamonds and I, I think they represent the same sparkle, the same fire and they're here on earth. Today the legendary curse of the Hope Diamond is just one part of the captivating story of this near-perfect gem. Most of the people who have studied and care for it say they would have no fear of owning the nefarious diamond. I would wear it and enjoy it. I think if I owned the Hope Diamond, I would be delighted to wear it, own it, pocket it, save it, and, uh, and treasure it. Perhaps more than anything, the curse of the Hope Diamond is kept alive by our desire to believe there is a force greater than all of us, keeping even the rich and powerful in check. Of course, to actually believe that such power resides in a 45 and a half carat blue diamond defies common sense. Even if some find the legendary story as irresistible as the stone's own dazzling glow.